<laughs> Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. I'll be tonight's host, along with Gene Hislop, my co-host. And we have a very special guest, Sean Sweeney, who's going to be here for a couple of shows. Sean is associated with the Jane Goodall Institute, and, but I'm going to let him introduce himself. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'm Sean Sweeney, as you mentioned, and uh, I work with the Jane Goodall Institute, specifically with our... Um, uh, youth program, uh, Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots. So um, I work here in the Danbury area at uh, Western Connecticut State. So we've had a relationship with Westcon for about 15 years and um, have, it was actually the first Roots and Shoots office in the United States. So, Well, so. first we want to point out that um, our greeting today was actually a happy anniversary to Jane Goodall, who is celebrating her 50th, sorry, anniversary of research in Gombe. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that leads us into, for you know, the viewer who might not know, who is Jane Goodall? Mm -hmm. What is the Jane Goodall Institute? So let's start with a little, you know, really brief background on, on Jane Goodall. Yeah, sure. So uh, Jane is a very famous primatologist and now conservationist and humanitarian. Um, she started her research, as you said, about 50 years ago with, um, with uh, chimpanzees in Tanzania uh, in a place that's called, now, now it's Gombe Stream National Park. Mm -hmm. um, and there she um, was one of the first people to do f field research with chimpanzees in the wild. Okay. So, and that research is still going on today. And that's so. much of what we've known about chimpanzees and their behavior has come from Jane's <coughs> research. So. Yeah, you know, um, Jane made a lot of really huge discoveries in her, in her time doing research with chimps. Um, and I think that her work has, you know, sparked a lot of other work, not only with chimpanzees, but also with um, other animals as well. So I think probably her most notable um, discovery is that um, she um, made observations of chimps using tools, making and using tools. And at the time, um, chimps, well, uh, hum man, man, woman, mm -hmm. people, um, homo sapiens, were known to be the only beings, only species but on the planet. Tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what Jane observed specifically was the chimps taking twigs or blades of grass and sticking them into these huge termite mounds mm -hmm. and, um, you know, pull, getting the, the termites to come out on Which them. Would be like and then, fishing. Yeah, you know? exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what they call the behavior, termite fishing. Oh, really? So, yeah. And then all over Africa, um, researchers have looked at chimps as well and um, many other animals and observe other tool using behaviors using rocks as hammers or other um, forms of fishing. Um, they actually have um, uh, some observations of chimps using um, sticks as weapons to hunt animals. Wow. So. Wow. And all of us, of course, that are, that are fans of National Geographic remember all these great things brought to our attention through the through the pages of National Geographic. Yeah. Particularly, I remember the picture of the chimp using the, the twig yep. into the uh, the termite mound and the termites of course would be drawn to something stirring stirring in there, climb onto it and, and voila, food. Right. Yeah. Now what's exactly. a, what's amazing is that she was not a um, zoologist or a primatologist at the time that she began doing this. Right. It was really born out of a passion. Mm -hmm. And today we have you know, out of that passion, the Jane Goodall Institute. Mm -hmm. Now, what, besides obviously studying the apes, does the Jane Goodall Institute do? Well, um, you know, our, our greatest mission is to ensure the, you know, hopeful future of chimpanzees on the planet. They're extremely endangered for a number of reasons. So, you know, we that's our, our main focus, but, um, or our, our main drive. Mm -hmm. But um, the... Um, way that we go about ensuring that hopeful future for them is um, is through community centered conservation, and that happens in a couple of ways directly in in Tanzania and other places in Africa. 
Excellent. Um, where we work with people, um, and you know what Jane identified is that chimpanzees. Um, it's all <clears throat> sorry. It's all well and good for us to, you know, work to ch- save the chimpanzees, but we're not going to be successful unless the people that live in the villages and areas around chimp habitat come on as our partners and they live in conditions where they can understand what we're trying to do and why we're trying to save chimpanzees. So that um, led to our Takari program where we do um, sustainable community development with a lot of villages around um, Gombe Stream National Park and, as I said, in other places. If I can um, just pause that for a minute, Mm -hmm. Um, I was talking with you earlier. Um, At one point, I was very fortunate to actually see Jane Goodall do a lecture at WestCon. And what intrigued me about her and the programs that she runs, both uh, Jane Goodall and and Roots and Shoots, um, reinforce what you're saying and almost give it a little more depth. What she said about her philosophy was that she realized you can't protect the apes until you eliminate the root cause of the deforestation and um, you know poaching and all of that, which affects the apes directly. Mm-hmm. So therefore... Poverty and war are two big issues that Jane Goodall Institute, you know, has been involved in education and, and such about because that those are the root causes of the deforestation. Likewise, you know, you might be able to give us a little more depth onto how those directly affect, you know, the apes. Yeah, well, I think um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, you know, we've been directly involved in working on war or poverty or um Poverty somewhat, I think, but um, uh, I think what Jane, what Jane and what we do and understand in our practice is really that all of these issues are interconnected. Mm-hmm. And it, unless we tackle them with a holistic lens and with a holistic approach, we're not going to be able to see any kind of you know, dynamic change and dynamic change that we really need to see. So um, you know, that's why... In our effort to save chimpanzees, we're working with human populations and, you know, trying to improve their well-being. Um, and, you know, the thing that I'll mention about that is that, um, mention about that too, is that it's not really um, a program where we are coming in and, you know, uh, dictating how things should happen. All of this stuff is uh, happens through helping people understand that they are empowered to, you know, improve their communities and change the way that their world functions. And so it's a lot of, um, you know, um, capacity building and that kind of thing. So that all of these efforts really come from within versus you know some kind of outside force doing it. So um, you know that also helps to go towards that holistic approach because then it's the communities who are actually taking on the issues and looking at all of them across the board and their entire, you know, entire way of living and that kind of thing. So, and it's also the approach that we take with Roots and Shoots, which you mentioned, our youth program. Mm -hmm. So It sounds like long-term, it's actually going to be the people that actually are indigenous, that live in the area, Mm -hmm. are the ones that are going to carry on the battle into the future. Yeah. That's that's really the big hope, for sure. Do a lot of the indigenous uh, people in the Gombe area participate in the conservation programs that you have currently running there? Yeah, so... um, they we have about um, 218 staff members in Tanzania, and a lot of them work in that... Takari program um, and the sustainable development work that we do there. Um, They also continue to work at Gombe Stream as well, working on the the research that um, Dr. Jane started. So, and that's been a practice that Jane has had from the beginning, you know, from when she first started going there, involving local people and the work. Now, what are the sustainable living um, programs that you're currently involved in um, down there in, in the Gombe? Yeah, there's there's a lot of different things. Um, <coughs> they, uh, I think, a really big focus is on sustainable agriculture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as the population of Africa grows, the um, you know the demand for 
land to grow food increases and um, there's not a culture there for sustainable agriculture where they understand um, they understand how to grow more food in less space mm-hmm. um, so we've worked there to help them um, generate new methods of farming and ways of um, using their land so that you know they're using it um, so that um, they can t- reuse rotate land, crops yeah, and rotate such. crops, and um, you know, ultimately, like I said, be able to use less space and and grow more food and uh, maintain the health of the soil, and um, you know, maybe even make it better. And learning so. other kinds of um, heating. Um, stoves as well. I had read on the website instead mm-hmm. of using wood burning stoves. What kind of um, alternatives are you uh, suggesting? At um, that point? That's something I'm not super uh, familiar not with, mm-hmm. um, but I know that there is a lot of work um, with fuel efficient stoves and trying to um, reduce the amount of re- reduce deforestation mm-hmm. because they you know they need the wood for cooking food and all of those kinds of things so developing new ways that they can um, that they can cook their food without that wood is definitely something that we've worked on and um, there as we were talking earlier there's so much going on there's uh, it's always hard to keep up with everything. So Absolutely. our website, janegoodall.org, is a really Jane, great... I was going to ask, janegoodall.org. Yeah. Jane so that's where, where folks yeah. can go to find out answers to specific mm-hmm. questions on specific areas. Yeah. There's also been a lot of work asking about other projects with um, water conservation, hydroelectric dams, um, putting in um, water cisterns at schools, um, rainwater collection systems um, at schools so kids don't have to, you know travel very far to to have water Mm -hmm. at school and there's other things like um which is something i think you'll be really interested in we one of the things that prevents young girls from attending school um feminine products what's that well it's actually um just the availability of latrines Mm -hmm. so you know putting building those so that they have when they when they reach their adolescence and mm-hmm. start going through puberty, they have a place where they can, you know, take care of themselves. So, you know, that's been one one very simple thing, just mm-hmm. installing latrines. Which, so. you know, you never think about that, but I remember um, one of the major feminine product companies, Tampax, actually has a program running to donate feminine mm-hmm. hygiene products to girls in Africa because, you know, if they were to get their monthly cycle, a lot of these girls would stay home because there was nothing that they could do. Mm-hmm. They didn't have these products. So the latrine aspect was something I didn't even consider, yeah. even after hearing this. Mm-hmm. You know, they might have the products, but would they have a place, especially a safe place? And right. a lot of areas in Africa are very war-torn right now, and women are often the victims of poverty and violence and war, yeah. you know? And so to have a safe place close to a school where they could go is yeah. a very worthwhile project. And, you know, that brings up a really good point. I think even though Tanzania is where w- w- most of our work is focused, um, even though it's very um, impoverished and, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's a lot of work to be done there, Um, the conflict that's there is very minimal, so if at all. So, you know, that's one thing that is definitely really, really great. I wonder if that's partly a result of the work that you've done over the 50 years that Jane Goodall Institute has been in that area, you know? Yeah, I I, I don't know. There's, I don't know that we could quantify that, but... um, but it's definitely made a positive yeah, impact. Intuitively, Absolutely. you know that it's, that it's been beneficial mm-hmm. to some degree. Yeah, yeah. Now, so. many people would ask, um, beyond the we like animals aspect mm-hmm. of conservation, why preserve apes? What, I mean, you know, besides we don't like to see, I, I agree with you, nobody, yeah. you know, I don't want to see species die off or anything, but what is it important... What contribution does that make to us? What kind of uh, intrinsic value, mm-hmm. you know, people is there in conserving? People always want to know what's what benefit is it to us? Yeah, I mean, I would assume we'd learn a lot about human nature by studying other primates, mm-hmm. but is that? And you know, I think I really think we have, um, and you know, one of the things is that chimpanzees are our closest living relative in the animal kingdom mm-hmm. share over 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, one of those things that, um, 
it's like if we're not going to save our closest living relative in the, the animal kingdom, then how can you know, we hope to save ourselves? Exactly, and how can we? And how can we? Um, how can we expect to save any other species? You know, mm-hmm. and it's also one of those things too where we're talking about the holistic aspect of it. Um, our efforts are holistic, and so in while saving the chimpanzee we're doing so much to saving the rainforest exactly. which obviously helps the environment exactly. and the, the air and creating you know sustainable systems in africa and hopefully you know working towards a healthier africa and you know um trying to eliminate a lot of those problems there and that's all geared towards you know with the end game end goal being to save the chimpanzee, but mm-hmm. along the way we're doing a lot of other really really good things. Yeah. Right. Certainly, so. what we learn in one part of the world, we can apply somewhere else in the world. Yeah, even here at home. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and you know, I think one of Jane's most famous quotes is that you know every individual makes a difference every day, and it's just our, you know it's we have the gift of our lives to you know decide how we you know make, make that difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now, what is um, how did you become involved on a personal note? How did you become involved with the institute and the work that it does, and your interest in you know apes and such? How did that develop? Um, Well, just starting with that question, um, I've been very lucky to have a lot of people in my life that have drawn my attention to nature and you know life sciences and that kind of thing my dad um was a life science teacher in high school for 34 years and my mom was a nurse Mm -hmm. so certainly between the two of them you know my attention was always drawn to you know fascination with nature and you know how living systems work and all of that kind of thing and uh um so i just have a million memories and that's how i just became really fascinated with science and the environment and nature and that kind of thing. And uh, um, because of those interests, actually, my grandma Marge um, introduced me to a photographer in the Cleveland area. I grew up in Ohio, and uh, his name was Alan Brown. He had worked for the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, who oh, Diane yeah. Fossey is Another actually a... Yeah, she's a counterpart to Jane, who worked with mountain gorillas. Mm-hmm. And um, so um, he had done work for the um, for Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, and um, uh, my grandma actually bought me one of his photos, and um, introduced me to what brought me to one of his lectures where I learned about the bushmeat trade and you know all of the issues in Africa mm-hmm. at, and this is all when I was 10 wow. so I was very very young and uh, you know from that experience you know that kind of set me on a course to being really fascinated with primates and um, just really excited about learning more about them and wanting to save them so that actually um put me through into college where I went to school specifically so that I could get a degree in animal behavior and so that I could study primates. And, um, I went to the college of Worcester and, uh, one, the, the fall of my junior year, Jane was actually brought to campus as like the, you know, the, um, featured speaker for the fall forum series on our campus. And, um, I had the opportunity to meet her through that event and, told her that I would actually quit school to go work for go her. Go into a little and, bit more detail about, about meeting her, because in what you're, what you're, you mentioned earlier before we went on the air, about what your, what your goal was and how you didn't get exactly what you were looking for, but you got a pretty good consolation right. prize. So, so my initial um, interest was in you know, being uh, the person who introduced her for her lecture. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that was a, you know, a standard thing that was reserved for a member of the faculty. Mm -hmm. So, and actually my advisor at the time was the one who gave her, you know, introduction. So, um, I ended up, uh, going with the driver to the Cleveland airport to pick Jane and, you know, her staff at the time up and bring them back to campus. So that was, that was our first. What a great opportunity. Yeah, Yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was totally amazing. Um, and, you know, at the airport, I told her I would give up school. And, you know, she told me that 
that it was so important that I get my degree and finish it, and that if I wanted to get involved, I should get involved with Roots and Shoots. So, which is was, an amazing example of what an incredible role model she mm-hmm. is. You know, to really take that time and say, "Wait a minute, that would be a huge mistake for your future. Yeah. You need to stay in school." Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, it would have been easy for her to say, "Well, yeah, you know, you're really passionate. You go for your dreams. You know, and mm-hmm. give you some kind of pat answer." But she gave you the truth, yeah. and yep. so she's an amazing woman in many ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I got involved with Roots and Shoots as our, you know, the president of our club on campus for two years, and then um, through that took advantage of a lot of different leadership opportunities that Roots and Shoots has, mm-hmm. and um, ultimately um, got on staff. That's great. So, and so what specifically do you do at the Jane Goodall Institute at this point? Yeah, so um, I, I work, as I mentioned earlier, with um, Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on our national staff, so um, we have um, regional staff all over the country, and um, I work with our headquarters staff. They're actually down in Washington, D.C. area, mm-hmm. um, but my work mostly focuses on um, capturing the stories and the you know, the great work that our members are doing in their communities and, you know, drawing attention to them both, you know, online. I mentioned earlier, I Mm -hmm. work a lot with rootsandshoots.org, our website for um, our youth program. So I work a lot with that and, you know, also with media and press and print media, that kind of thing. So, uh, so whereas a lot of people <laughs> that you come in contact with will probably never have the opportunity to actually go to Africa mm-hmm. to see things firsthand. So what you have to do is translate it into a, a method that, that you can expose them to here yeah. to get them excited and what they can do here, right. like what you do here in the United <coughs> States to, get, uh, to, to advance the cause. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's... The lucky thing for me is that our work is really, my work is really focused on Roots and Shoots and the work that our members are doing in 120 countries around the globe. So it's always really great stories coming in and, um, you know, and also working um, to, you know, rally people around certain things, actions that we have going on and that kind of thing. Um, and I also work with our, we have seven youth leadership councils in the United States. So I work from a national point of view, both to mentor two of the councils, our college leadership council and our national leadership council, and then to help our regional staff with theirs as well. So um, so it's kind of split between communications and marketing and then also on um, our youth leadership work as well. So No, we're definitely going to be focusing more on the roots and shoots aspect in the second show. But as we're winding down, um, your personal experiences, again, uh, working with Apes, was that mainly while you were in college working at the Primate Center? Do you have, you know, were you working with zoos and stuff like that? Well, um, it's actually been in a couple of different ways. Um, At the College of Worcester, we actually had a a colony of black-capped capuchin monkeys there. They're um, real little guys they're from so yeah, they're from uh, <laughs> South America, mm-hmm. um, New they're World. The really ones, the really skinny arms and legs, almost like are um, they sort of like spider monkeys, almost well, in appearance. They're even smaller than spider monkeys. Wow. Um, so they're I don't know. They're probably about from the top of their head to their feet. Like if they're standing up, they're probably. I don't know, 16 inches tall or something like that. That's quite yeah, small. Yeah, they're, they're little guys, but um, they're incredibly intelligent and a lot of times studied um, as the, the chimp of the new world because mm-hmm. um, they, they are so intelligent and have also shown capabilities for tool use and you know all different kinds of really neat behavior. So um, all the research we did there with them was behavioral research and lots of really, really neat things, again, with tool use but other stuff with like self-recognition and the mirror um looking at that kind of stuff and handedness Mm -hmm. actually um have you know established certain things in primate species just like humans have a dominant hand looking at that kind of stuff so really neat research and uh so that was that was the work there and then actually through um the, my senior independent study, I actually started research at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, and um, my my research actually kind of changed a little bit in to rather than studying 
animals themselves, studying how people perceive animals, oh. and awesome. you know how experiences like a visit to a zoo contribute to people's conservation knowledge and their behavior and that kind of thing. So we actually did a really neat study when. Um, in Cleveland, we had wild chimpanzees, Jane Goodall's mm-hmm. Wild Chimpanzees. It's this great natural history museum exhibit. Had that at our natural history museum. We had um, Jane's um, IMAX movie, Wild Chimpanzees, mm-hmm. at our um, science center. And then we had our chimp exhibit at the zoo. We did a you know three site comparison mm-hmm. of you know people's experience and and that kind of thing. So wow. my research there kind of morphed more into studying people. And you know how they understand chimpanzees versus studying them themselves. Okay, when I go to the zoo, mm-hmm. I take my kids, take my grandkids, well, my grandkids now to the zoo. Mm-hmm. What should, what, what could, what should I be doing to interact? Can I interact with with the different uh, species of monkeys that are going to be in a zoo? Can I, can I observe? What should I be looking for? What should I? Anything to notice about their yeah. behavior in zoos that we mm-hmm. might know what their behaviors are yeah. or how can like I that? learn more about them by being that distance from them yeah well <clears throat> I think that um, if you have enough time <laughs> the actually uh, the amount of time that people spend you know yeah. actually observing the 10, animals 10 is, 15 minutes that's all that's even, it even I mean in an some hour, studies show in an hour, like could you learn five something? minutes you know huh? yeah I mean I think you can especially with uh, primates because they're so social mm-hmm. so the things that always you know excite me is to look at you know how they're interacting with each other and you know if you can recognize differences between them and be able to follow a single one and like their interactions and that kind of thing it's it's always really neat to see who's hanging out with who and you know that kind of thing and a lot a lot of zoos um, <clears throat> do enrichment with their animals as well, as well. Um, and uh, they. I always like seeing how they interact with the different types of enrichment that they have there. So. All so, different kinds of cool stuff. So we'll notice, for instance, grooming behavior. I think uh-huh. we are all familiar with grooving, grooming behavior. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah that's 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 just awesome. But, we're going to wind down now with a couple more thoughts, and then we're going to take a break come back and do a second show. Wind us down with um, uh, with a thought to take us into the second How show. How about your favorite, favorite ape? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I have something else, too. So okay. I'll, I'll explain. My favorite ape, uh, actually, as we were talking earlier, is uh, Siamang. They're from Southeast Asia and super, really, really neat um, animal that pair for life and... Uh, sing duets, so yeah, really, really, really. <laughs> oh, cute. that's outstanding. Yeah, uh, so, love is in the air. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, but you know, the way that I would leave our conversation tonight is, um, I think Jane's biggest thing is all about hope. You know, she sees her, you know, her work as being about bringing hope to the world, and um, I think that there's certainly a lot of success stories out there to show that, you know. There is, there's definitely hope, and she always says that as long as there's hope, then you know, we can make sure that we can continue living and live well. So, we well, thank you so much for joining us, sure, and thank you. you know, it's always great to learn about what Jane's doing in, in the world, and um, you know, she's definitely an amazing human being, and um, it's an amazing organization, and it's been wonderful having you on. Glad to and, be and there is so hope. <laughs> For another episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.